to the conquest of Bengal, Mysore, and the Maratha kingdom, the Britishers continued with the policy of conquests. They now set their eyes upon the kingdom of Sindh. So their next target was the conquest of Sindh, but it was the gradual. It was this. It was you know. It was a steady progress as far as the steady you know, as far as the conquest of Sindh is concerned. They didn't went. You know, they didn't achieve the conquest of Sindh at one point of time. It was a gradual ascendancy of power. It was the gradual ascendancy of British power over the principality of Sindh. Okay, so Sindh. During the 18th century, it was ruled by the tribal chiefs. Those were known as Alora chiefs. So these were the Aloras. These were the Kaloras. The tribe called Kaloras who were ruling over Sindh during the first half of 18th century. The Karolas. The Kaloras, the chief, the, the ruler of these Karolas who were ruling over the Sindh at that point of time, he was known by the name of Gulam Shah. Gulam Shah. This Gulam Shah had a friendly, friendly relationship with the English East India Company, with the Britishers, and he gave them various uh, trading concessions. He agreed that he will never, you know, he will never uh, let. Any European to trade in his kingdom, only English would be entitled entitled to trade in his kingdom at Sindh. Then again, you know the 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 Britishers had already gained some trading concessions, some trading privilege. You know they were given trading privilege earlier on by the Mughal emperors also. They considered they considered this, uh, you know they considered this Sindh as the part of. Is the part of their, you know, uh, their trade and commerce. In that sense, they had earlier on established their factory at Thatta. Thatta during those days was an important commercial center of Sindh. But what happened in eighteen seventy in seventeen eighties? The new tribal chiefs, the new tribe, descended from the hills and they started to. Attack these Kaloras. They were successful, and they replaced these Kaloras. These chiefs, the new tribe which came to rule over Sindh after these Kaloras, who replaced these Kal uh, these Kaloras, they were Talpuras. It was a Talpura tribe. They were the Talpuras. Okay, it was Mir Fateh Ali Khan. Mir Fateh Ali Khan. Who was the important leader of this Talputra Talpura tribe? This Mir Fateh Ali Khan or the Talpuras now were able to replace the Kaloras as the new chiefs, as the new rulers of Sindh, as the new rulers of Sindh. So, what this Mir Fateh Ali Khan when he when he replaced these Kaloras, he divided his kingdom. He divided he divided his kingdom of Sindh among his Three brothers. That means there were now four brothers. There were now four brothers. This was the feature of Abhagan polity. Actually, the Abhagan polity was based upon the principle of equality. They were, you know, uh, they, they considered the ruler one among the equals. Various chiefs were ruling over the other, uh, uh, you know, over the various parts of the empire. It was not like the Mughal Empire or some other empire who were who were centralizing power into their own hands. The Mughal theory of kingship is is different. Was different than the Afghan theory of kingship. Afghan theory of kingship always believe in equality. They divide the kingdom into various parts, and one chief was heading that part of kingdom, and they used to have a kind of independent authority over their respective kingdoms. Same was there. What happened when Mir Fateh Ali Khan, when he, you know, when he became the king, when he became the ruler of Sindh, he divided his kingdom among his three brothers. Then four brothers became to rule. Came to rule. Or the same. These four brothers are known collectively by the name of by the name of Char Yars. Okay, Char Yars. Char Yars. Four friends. Four friends. As Char Yars. It, it, these were the Char Yars who now became the rulers of Sindh. And these Char Yars they claimed that they claimed themselves as Amirs. So from here, Sindh came to be ruled, you know, by the Amirs. Amirs of Sindh. 
जिसे हम कहते हैं नवाब ऑफ कलकत्ता नवाब ऑफ बंगाल ऐसे अब यहां पे कहते हैं अमीर ऑफ सिंध सो दीज विद अमीर केम टू रूल ओवर द सिंध द फर्स्ट यू नो नो ब्रिटिशर्स ब्रिटिशर्स विल ऑलवेज है इंटरेस्ट टूवर्ड्स द सिंध बिकॉज सिंध वॉज कंसिडर्ड एज द फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस बाय द ब्रिटिश ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी अगेंस्ट इन पॉसिबल against any possible foreign invasion at during those times they were facing the great threat at the hands of french because french during those days was ruled by napoleon napoleon was creating a great problem for british then there was also threat faced from the russian side okay the threat faced by the the, the, the threat which was faced by the britishers from the napoleon it motivated them to take a forward policy towards the sin to bring this sin under their influence so that so that you know they could protect their indian empire from any possible wrath from any possible invasion from the french side or the russian side at you know sometimes in european history these russians and the french uh, you know th these nations they forged some alliances quite often they were into a common alliance and that alliance was considered as a threat by the britishers in india that alliance was seen by the rulers like lord wellesley as a major threat towards his indian empire it was you know so these factors motivated the britishers to take forward policy towards the sin in in addition to this there was also a commercial interest as well commercial interest as well because as you know sindh is situated on the river in this in this river in this is having or was having a huge commercial possibilities there is a huge commercial possibility navigation wagera jo transport agar aap us river ke through karte ho to aap aap toll laga tolls laga sakte ho toll tax wagera laga sakte ho us transport wagera pe so there was a commercial possibility as well so these factors motivated the policy of britishers towards the same and it was in that context that lord wellesley tried to you know lord wellesley tried to make a first contact right to make a first contact with the with the with the amirs of sindh okay this lord wellesley what he did he sent he sent his uh, he sent few personnel his uh, commanders to the court of amirs for a kind of treaty for a kind of treaty so that he could you know there was always uh, as i told you there was always a threat faced by the french and at the beginning you know around 1800 around 1800 uh, i mean around 1798 1799 or 1800 there was this perception which was going in the minds of britishers that tipu sultan was making alliance with the with the amirs of sindh it was thought that tipu sultan was making alliance with the afghans as well so uh, you know tipu sultan had always relationship with the france as well as i told you when i when i uh, was teaching you about the tipu sultan how he uh, you know how he praised the french nation how he uh, planted uh, the tree of liberty to commemorate the french revolution of 1789 kind of things so uh, he was always inclined towards the french towards the france and that you know uh, uh, they thought this lord wellesley thought that there is quite a possibility that if lord if you know if this napoleon if the french nation comes into alliance with the tipu sultan it could be a great great danger for them so this lord wellesley tried to make a treaty with the amirs but he failed lord wellesley is known for his policy of subsidiary alliance system subsidiary alliance system was used as a tool of expansion by the lord wellesley he tried to impose that subsidiary alliance system upon the amirs of sindh as well one of the main reasons why he actually applied the policy of subsidiary alliance system in india was that there was a threat which was posed posed to indian empire to the british indian empire by the napoleon by the france so one of the reasons for his subsidiary alliance system was the threat posed by the french nation posed by the napoleon 
it was in line of those things, those happenings that this Lord Wellesley tried to impose his policy of subsidiary alliances system upon the emirs, but they denied and they failed. This Lord Wellesley failed. In fact, there was an agent. There was an agent, British agent. He was known by the name of Crow. This Crow, he was, you know, he was thrown away from uh, from the Sindh. He was thrown away from the Sindh by the emirs. Okay, so. But you know the English uh, uh, didn't lose uh, hope and the mission to bring this Sindh into the domination of British Empire it continued. It was followed by various governor general, uh, governor general uh, generals who came to the power after this Lord Wellesley as well. One among those governor generals was Lord Minto. Lord Minto, right? This Lord Minto signed was your lord minto successfully signs a treaty that treaty is known as treaty of eternal friendship treaty of eternal friendship with the amis it was signed in 1808 and under this treaty of eternal friendship lord minto was able to gain something from the emirs of Sindh. How? They assured, you know, they assured, the emirs of Sindh assured this Lord Minto that they will not let any French resident to settle in Sindh. It was the first provision of that treaty. They would not, they, you know, they would not allow any French resident or a French trader to settle in Sindh. Furthermore, later on, they also accepted that they will not allow any American resident to settle in Sindh. In that way, this was the first intervention of the Britishers with the Amirs of Sin and they you know they got this surety they got this surety from the Amirs of Sin that they you know they uh, you know uh, they were now able to monopolize their trade in this uh, in the province of Sin right so this was the first step towards the ascendancy of British influence over the Sin now then there was another governor general, Lord William Bentinck. Lord William Bentinck is an important governor general. I will give you a separate lecture upon the various important governor generals, uh, generals of India. This Lord William Bentinck is having a tremendous contribution towards the socio political, uh, you know, towards the socio political uh, achievements of India as well. So, this Lord William Bentinck he sends a mission under Colonel. Pottinger. He sends this person, he sends this person, Colonel Pontinger, he sends this person to Sindh, to the court of Amir. And this Colonel Pottinger was able to sign a treaty with the Amirs of Sindh in 1832. Under that treaty, this Sindh was further brought under the control of Britishers. By the terms of this treaty, you know. By the terms of this uh, treaty, the Sindh, the, the Amirs of Sindh allowed, they allowed the free passage. They allowed the free passage for the for the British traders. They allowed the free passage for the British traders. And the British travellers through Sindh. Sindh ke raste se wo ja sakte the. They, they, you know, they were, they were let free to trade in the province of Sindh by the emirs of Sindh under, under, under this treaty of 1832. Okay, but they were needed, you know, it was told by the emirs to this Lord William Mantic, but they will need, you know, they will need a passport for that. They will need a travel document for that. Okay? They will need a travel document for that. Furthermore, River Indus. River Indus. River Indus was thrown open for trade. It was told by the British, you know, under this agreement, River Indus was thrown open for the trade. The Europeans, I mean, the Britishers only, not Europeans. Britishers were 
always against the other Europeans in India. Remember that. So this, you know, this Britishers were not let open that they could travel through the river in this for the commercial purposes, for the trading purposes only. However, the arms and equipments, the arms and armaments, the hathiyar jo hai, unko jo hai, aap river, is, in this river ke through supply, aap transport nahi kar sakte ho. So this was also a provision there. Then, if the Amirs, if the Amirs will, you know, uh, you know, there will be not any kind of toll or tax on the river and in this, if the Amir decides sometime that, you know, agar Amir ko aisa lagta hai ki bhai, I have to modify some tax rules, tax legislations, so that tax rules must not harm the interests of the British traders. Aisa jo hai, is treaty ke andar bataya gaya hai hampe, okay? So, uh, this was, again, this was the second step towards the ascendancy of British uh, power into uh, this, into the kingdom of, uh, you know, this, into the kingdom of Sindh, which was ruled by the Amirs, alright? Then they, Proceeded further and after Lord William Bentick, it was Lord Auckland. Okay, Lord Auckland. When Lord Auckland became the Governor General, the, he became the Governor General in 1836. He also proceeded with a forward policy. Forward policy when you are proceeding towards the subjugation of the rival country, rival kingdom. Okay, so he proceeds with this forward policy and he tries to bring a uh, Sindh under his domination, under his control. For that, what he did, he sends, you know, he sends another mission, uh, uh, to, you know, uh, to the court of Amirs. And therein, this Auckland tries to, you know, sign another treaty with the Amirs of Sindh. He was, you know, he was making every possible effort to make you know to, to make the Sindh to make these Amirs to sign this uh, subsidiary alliance system okay the opportunity to this person the, the opportunity to this person to this Lord Auckland it was provided to him by Maharaja Ranjit Singh of Punjab Maharaja Ranjit Singh was an able ruler of the Punjab, no for sure. If you read the conquest of Punjab, you will get a little bit of an idea here about Ranjit Singh's activities. This Ranjit Singh, what he did, he captured, he annexed Rojan. Rojan was a, a small, uh, you know, a small town near Sindh. When he annexed Rojan, so Britishers, kya hai? Britishers, ne, Britishers immediately went to the court of Emirs and they told the Emirs that see, Ranjit Singh is creating threat not only for we people but he is creating threat for you people as well because he has recently acquired the Orojan and maybe tomorrow he could you know a, a simple, easily conquer your territory as well. Why don't you come into an agreement with us and why don't we protect you? Okay, it was, you know, it was on that pretext. Unko daraya, you know, Ranjit Singh, uh, in fact, ye bhi khabar Ranjit Singh jo hai, he is in alliance with the other powers as well. So he is trying, you know, he is making every possible move to bring this scene into his, you know, into, 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 into his control. To us chakar mein jo hai, these Amirs jo hai, they were, you know, they, they didn't, they never wanted any kind of agreement with the Britishers, but the circumstances were such that they had to obey with the orders of Britishers because such was the might of uh, Britishers during those days. The Emirs never, uh, Emirs were never matching with the power of these Britishers. So it was in that context that this Ranjit Singh was uh, put forward as an excuse by the English, by the Britishers, and how these Emirs they came into an agreement with this Lord Auckland, and this Lord Auckland, what he did, he uh, now, uh, see, he now, you know, uh, he makes them uh, to, you know, he brings this Sindh into the British protectorate. British protectorate. So, Sindh was brought into British protection in 1838. By this, Sindh accepted a huge army, huge British army at his capital. Okay. This uh, Amirs they have accepted that by uh, British army will protect us here. At the same time, this you know uh, under this agreement, this British they, they they make it sure they ensured that not any non-European, not any you know this European or the American would get any kind of employment in in the court of Amirs of Sindh. 
Okay, so finally it was the subsidiary alliance system, which was you know it was a subsidiary alliance system which was imposed over Sindh in 1839. So Sindh accepted the subsidiary alliance system in 1839. Then when I will uh, you know teach you about the subsidiary alliance system, there are various features. One of the features of subsidiary alliance system is that a resident is placed in the court of the native kingdom. So the resident jo hai, that, that resident ensures that the policy of that kingdom are being carried on as per the interests of the British Empire. Same was done under this subsidiary alliance system. The resident, the resident was placed at the court of Emirs of Sindh, and this, uh, you know, uh, that resident could uh, do whatever he would like, and, and that resident will be protected by the British forces, not by the forces of Emir. Okay, so this is how in 1839 the Sindh was, uh, you know, forced to sign the subsidiary alliance system. But this is not the end of this, uh, you know, uh, British conquest of Sindh. There is a difference between the subsidiary alliance system and the conquest and the annexation. The Britishers they wanted, they wanted to bring this seed directly and uh, in, into their control, into their annexation. Okay, and during those days, this there was a first Anglo-Afghan war which was going on. First Anglo-Afghan war. So this first Anglo-Afghan war was fought in 1839 and it continued after 1842. In that first Anglo-Afghan war, the Britishers were frustrated. They were not, they didn't met any huge success in this first Anglo-Afghan war. They met with the huge losses. Huge number of persons were, you know, they, they, they died fighting on behalf of the Britishers in this first Anglo-Afghan war. At that time, the governor general who succeeded Auckland perhaps, that his name is Lord Ellenborough. Lord Ellenborough. Lord Ellenborough. So this Lord Ellenborough, Priya, abhi, first Anglo Afghan war nahi hua tha na? So this Lord Ellenborough, the, he tried to, he tried to, what he tried, he tried to, you know, exploit the resources of Sindh for the, you know, which could be used for the Afghan conquest in the Afghan war. Okay, so he tried to make these things happen. So what he did, uh, this Lord Almero, uh, after after you know after his loss during the first Anglo-Afghan War, the Anglo-Afghan War hota hai, so he sends a person. He sends a person, a resident. His name is Outram. So the British resident, namely Outram, is sent to the Amirs of Sindh. in order to sign a new treaty. What kind of treaty? These Amirs were told that you were, you were, you know, you were involving yourself into, you know, you were involving yourself into the anti-British activities. For instance, they were charged with the allegations that they didn't help but the Britishers in the first Anglo-Afghan war. In fact, the majority of the first Anglo-Afghan war, that war was fought on the soil which was controlled by the Amirs of Sindh, which was under the position of Amirs of Sindh. But the Amirs, you know, Amirs, the first majority of the, the major part of the first Afghan war was fought on the soil of Amirs of Sindh. And these Amirs of Sindh were told by the Britishers that they should, you know, they should uh, give the resources for, you know, they should give the resources, they should give the land which could be used for, uh, you know, uh, which could be used against the Afghans in the first Anglo-Afghan war. So, what, whatever he can, he did to help the Britishers, but Britishers were not satisfied. When they, they were not satisfied, they made this excuse and they sent this old round to the court of Emirs and told them that you just, uh, you know, bring them under, uh, uh, under the direct control of the Britishers. What he did, he makes them, he forced them to sign another treaty. Under the terms of that treaty, these Amirs were told that you cannot mint. This is a treaty which was signed by Outram on behalf of Ellen Barrow. So under this, uh, the first provision of that treaty, you cannot mint, mint coins on your own name. If there is a coin currency, then the picture will be the queen, uh, uh, queen of England. Ki hogi. So you cannot mint the coins. Uh, on your own name. So the second provision was that 
uh, Amirs were told that if the British ships, if the British warships are going through the river in this, you have to supply fuel for that. You have to supply fuel for that. Then they were told that you have to surrender a few provinces as well. Provinces as well to the British ships. You have to supply fuel for the ship. So you have to supply, you know, you have uh, you have to surrender some provinces as well, which could give us the revenues because you have not fulfilled your promises during the first Anglo-Afghan war. So this was a kind of agreement which which was, you know, which was forcibly, which was one-sided agreement, which was, which was forced upon the Amirs of Sindh, Amirs of Talpuras. Okay. So they made one excuse or the other excuse by, way, by which they were able to bring this sin under their control. They also carried on, fulfilled the promises made under this agreement as well. But Lord Alan Barrow, then again, he sends second resident, second person to the court of Amis. His name is Sir Charles, Sir Charles Napier. Sir Charles Napier. This Sir Charles Napier was adamant from the first day that he had to annex the kingdom of Sindh altogether. Okay? So he was not in, he was always looking for this opportunity to bring directly this Sindh into his role, into his direct role, not into his indirect role. So when there was a direct intervention, when they, when they tried to bring this seen into their direct control, there was a kind of revolt from these Baluchis, from these Talpura Baluchis, the Baluchi tribes, from the from the uh, from these Amirs and their subjects. So that small kind of revolt which they were forced into, that was used again as an excuse by the Sir Charles Napier, and the Sir Charles Napier brings uses force and brings entire scene in 1843 into the direct control, into the annexation of the Britishers. Into the direct control of the Britishers. That is how this Sindh was conquered, the conquest of Sindh was made by the, you know, the, the, the person who is responsible for this annexation is Sir Charles Napier who then becomes the first governor, first British governor, first British governor of Sindh. He was made the first British governor of Sindh. Okay, the British conquest of Sindh has met with the universal condemnation on the part of, you know, by various historians or the politicians. It is something which has been criticized heavily among the academic circles. Lord Alan Barrow himself was, uh, you know, finding himself, you know, he also found himself guilty. This Sir Charles Napier also remembers that, you know, uh, what, uh, his statement that uh, we had no rights over the sin, but yet uh, a kind of rascality it will be to conquer this sin. As I would say, could be kaha Sir Charles Napier. Ne. So this was all about the conquest of sin. Now we will take the conquest of another kingdom, that is the conquest of Punjab. That's also important from the UPSC point of view, okay?